Uh, go ahead and start the recording. Recording has begun. Thank you very much. So welcome everyone. Um, this is our first webinar series in our 2015 webinar series, first webinar that is. And uh, today we'll be hearing from Dr. Lucinda Bateman of the Fatigue Consultation Clinic. She's going to be talking to us about uh, the SEID diagnostic criteria and how it will improve diagnosis and treatment. First, let me give a little bit of background on the Institute of Medicine, where this report originated from. The uh, Institute of Medicine is actually the medical arm of the National Academy of Sciences, which is a nonprofit, a private organization that um, deals with issues such as this that examine important policy and public health issues. For this particular IOM effort, or Institute of Medicine effort, there were 15 members on the committee. The, um, the committee was composed of six clinical experts, including Dr. Lucinda Bateman, and those were um, clinical experts in MECFS, and there were also experts in MECFS research, as well as um, other important and relevant domain experts such as people, investigators, researchers involved in symptom research and ethics research. The report um, took place, or the, the form, form, forming of this report, the writing of this report took place over an 18-month period. Once it was complete, the report was, was went through pretty um, intensive review, and there were 15 individuals that reviewed this report and many of the, the reviewers are actually, would actually be familiar to many of our audiences in our audience because they are also medical and research experts in, in uh, MECFS. I think that the end result is a landmark report for MECFS. It's going to be used for diagnosis and really guide treatment and research for the, for the foreseeable future. Can't thank Dr. Bateman enough for being um, really a critical player in this, this, this amazing point in time in MECFS. So Dr. Bateman was um, one, of the, one of the 15 on the committee, and Dr. Bateman is the founder of, and the director of the Fatigue Consultation Clinic. She's dedicated most of her professional career to MECFS um, clinical care and research. And she's cared for, she continues to care for many, many, many MECFS patients. And I don't know how she finds time to do it, but she also finds time to work with some of the top investigators in MECFS research. So in addition to her clinical schedule, she finds time to not only conduct research but publish some very important high-impact papers that are really providing a robust evidence base for um, MECFS research and the identification of biomarkers. So Dr. Bateman, it is a pleasure and an honor to have you with us today to kick off our 2015 webinar series, and we really look forward to your presentation. Thank you very, very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I am uh, delighted to be able to talk about the SEID diagnostic criteria and how I think they are going to improve diagnosis and treatment. Um, the Institute of Medicine report entitled Beyond MECFS uh, Re Redefining an Illness outlines these new diagnostic criteria, and I have put the um, the uh, link here for anybody who would like to go directly to the report and um, learn for themselves. I suggest people take it in small bites when you're doing that. The, because we should all know the value of these diagnostic criteria, I am going to take many of my comments directly from the summary and from the IOM report in talking about um, how I think these criteria will help diagnosis and treatment. Initially, um, 
I want to say that this illness is not diagnosed often enough. And in the summary, it uh, recognizes that one or two million people have the disorder, and yet in some of the early literature, only 10 or 15 percent of people identified had actually been diagnosed. And we know from a CFIDS Association uh, poll that um, only about 25 percent of patients get a diagnosis in the first year, and a third of people took more than five years to get a diagnosis. So our ability, our record and track record of physicians diagnosing this illness is abysmal. And we know this is because healthcare professional, professionals can be skeptical about how serious it is. They have misconceptions about it being psychological. But it's really uh, sad that less than one-third of medical schools include specific information on their curriculum, and only 40 percent of medical textbooks include information on this illness. And this comes straight from the Institute of Medicine report. So if people read it, they're going to understand uh, the nature of the problem. So why has ME-CFS not been diagnosed? Um, I'm going to give you some of my opinions about this and some uh, from the report. We, we know that especially uh, CFS by Fukuda criteria is seen as a diagnosis of exclusion, and some people consider that a garbage can diagnosis. And I looked up the definition of a diagnosis of exclusion to be precise. And it says a diagnosis reached by the process of elimination, which may be necessary if the illness cannot be established with complete confidence from history, examination, and testing. And that is uh, why we've had issues. I think the diagnosis can be established with confidence. And thinking otherwise often causes delays or leads to misdiagnosis of a psychological problem. And I also think it leads to physicians passing the patient from doctor to doctor to doctor with no one actually taking responsibility for managing and treating the diagnosis. We also know that the multiple overlapping case definitions have contributed, particularly the Fukuda CFS criteria and fibromyalgia criteria have a great deal of overlap. Um, I, I know that people in the field are familiar with the Canadian consensus criteria, but I can tell you that outside of the field, very few physicians uh, are familiar with the Canadian criteria, and even fewer are even aware that the international consensus criteria were published. So this confusion has led to very poor rates of diagnosis. What about treatment? Well, how have we done historically with treatments? Um, many uh, patients complain, and this again comes from the IOM report, that their health care providers do not know how to deliver appropriate care for their condition, and sometimes uh, use treatments that are, uh, have caught too many side effects or cause problems. Some people, as you know, report being subject to hostile attitudes. Uh, when I teach uh, the, PA, the PA students about making a diagnosis, I usually ask for a raise of hands how many uh, have heard negative stereotypes or heard physicians that teach them um, say things about fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome, and usually 80 percent of the students raise their hands saying that they have uh, been exposed to that in, as students. So we know that these things exist, and uh, that leads to uh, the lack of not only diagnosis but of treatment. And many people can't find a doctor who will accept someone with a diagnosis and provide care. Uh, I've also had people tell me uh, that, that a doctor says, I don't see people with that, or that there's no treatment for it. And none of those things are true, of course. So we have fertile ground for making progress, put it that way. So the purpose of the IOM report is to improve clinical diagnosis. The charge to the committee was to recommend clinical diagnostic criteria to solve these problems for healthcare providers, for patients and their caregivers. So you probably know this, but these were the specific, this, this was the statement of task to go to the research base, or identify the evidence, develop clinical diagnostic criteria based on what we have published in studies, recommend new terminology, which of course has been uh, somewhat controversial, SEID or systemic exertion intolerance disease. But also, the IOM report uh, was, 
we were commissioned to develop an outreach strategy for disseminating the new criteria nationwide to health care professionals. So you can see the scope of this report around improved diagnosis. And we weren't asked to investigate the cause, the uh, pathophysiology, the treatment of the illness, which uh, is for future research studies to address. The purpose of the report uh, was to improve diagnosis, and the committee really felt that new diagnostic criteria more focused on the presenting common symptoms would, uh, was warranted, would improve diagnosis. So the goal of these criteria was to kind of simplify and push the uh, major identifiable criteria forward so that clinicians would be able to recognize the illness and make a better diagnosis. So we won't spend too long on this, but these diagnostic criteria are, Gosh. number one, go ahead, number one, to the patient must have a substantially reduced function associated with this fatigue. And the chapter is on page 73, fatigue and its impact on function. That's what I have on the slide there. These are pages from the IOM report if you go to that link. The second diagnostic criteria is post-exertional malaise. So patients uh, develop a relapse or worsening illness when they exert themselves physically, cognitively, emotionally, or even with upright activity. The third is unrefreshing sleep, and the chapter is entitled Sleep-Related Symptoms on page 86. And these first three were almost always present in the studies uh, of the reviewed evidence. The fourth and fifth are either or. The uh, number four is cognitive impairment, which is in the chapter neurocognitive manifestations on page 96. And the fifth is orthostatic intolerance. And the chapter is entitled orthostatic intolerance and autonomic dysfunction on page 107. And these the fourth and fifth criteria, you can have one or both, uh, are frequently present, but not quite as universally present in everyone as the first three. And when viewed together as a combination, these findings distinguish SEID from other fatiguing disorders when they are present the majority of the time of moderate, substantial, or severe intensity. So they really have to be ever-present altogether, not ever-present, but the majority of the time, and of a moderate to severe intensity. And then pain, immune impairment, infection so symptoms continue to support the diagnosis. So why were these core diagnostic criteria chosen for SEID? Well, these were the ones that were the most frequent and the most severe uh, in the review, best supported by the evidence, and we tried to lean toward the symptoms that we have the best tools to measure so that it can move from a subjectively defined disorder to one that has more objectively measurable findings, particularly as we try to develop uh, biomarkers and move toward uh, learning about subsets of this illness. And the report emphasizes that SEID is a diagnosis to be made, not simply what's left over after everything is ruled out because uh, this can lead to delays, as we said. The diagnosis of SEID can be established with confidence from the history, examination, and the kind of testing that doctors learn how to do to work up symptoms. It's not a diagnosis of exclusion in that way. And of course that doesn't mean that other illnesses shouldn't be evaluated and treated. And in the, the first recommendation in the report, the official recommendation is that physicians should diagnose SEID if diagnostic criteria are met following an appropriate history, physical exam, and medical workup. That includes identifying treating depression, identifying primary sleep disorders, any other diagnosis, multiple sclerosis, um, other things that might present with confusing or overlapping symptoms. And if another diagnosis or combination of diagnoses in that period of workup during the differential diagnosis completely explains the clinical presentation, maybe there's no need to make a diagnosis of SEID. This would require clinical judgment, and sometimes it takes a while. Um, sometimes illnesses that are hard to diagnose emerge gradually as, uh, as you're tracking and following the patient and trying to treat things. But the most important thing is that patients with SEID can have other conditions 
they can develop, they can be present. So we don't want to lose people, we don't want to lose the diagnosis in people who, have, who truly have SEID just because they have other comorbid conditions that might be contributing to the symptoms. Now, this is what strengthens the report, is diagnostic tips are recommended for the healthcare provider in the report. And the number one advice to physicians is to listen to the patient. This is on page 213. Listen to the patient because the patient can describe what it feels like to have this illness. And in Dr. Lingo, that is take a careful and detailed history. That's very important and sometimes we get in a rush in medicine. The second uh, thing I want to emphasize is there's an entire section, section D in the appendix, that lists questionnaires and tools that are useful to physicians for making a diagnosis in each one of those categories. Questionnaires for fatigue, function, for example, the fibromyalgia impact questionnaire can, is a standardized questionnaire that can help a clinician determine how pain impairs function. It also has links to uh, the SF36 in the free form of that called the R the RAND 36, so that a clinician, if they want to know how to evaluate function, they can look in section D, find that questionnaire, and go, uh, they find a link to it online so they can download the questionnaire and use it in their clinic. This is true for fatigue function, post-exertional malaise, which we have fewer tools for, need to develop, but they need to be able to ask about it, so uh, they're helpful questions, so they know how to ask. Uh, tools for sleep, cognitive symptoms, orthostatic intolerance, and pain because uh, we have, the field has moved forward in terms of uh, how to assess pain based on the progress in fibromyalgia research. So these are really important. And not only that, each section of the report has a uh, specific and detailed review of what it is like when patients present with this symptom. For, in, for example, the core criteria are found in Chapter 4. And the description of how fatigue and functional impairment present in SEID or ME-CFS is on page 73, five pages worth. And there are several, many pages describing the presentation of post-exertional malaise, so doctors will recognize it. Same with sleep-related symptoms on page 86, neurocognitive manifestations, how patients suffer from this illness, how they might describe it, how it might present in the clinic, and the same with orthostatic intolerance and autonomic dysfunction. Chapter 5 is devoted to the other manifestations of illness that aren't considered the core criteria, but still the description of what we know from the science so far is listed in each one of those sections. And you can, I put the page numbers there, so if there's an area of interest to you, you can download the report and go to that page in the report and learn about it. And it may also give patients language for how to describe their symptoms to their doctor. And chapter six is all of those symptoms uh, discussed a little more briefly, briefly in the pediatric population. So, in addition to that in the report, there's some other ways diagnosis is going to improve. The second recommendation is to the federal government, and this includes the Department of Health and Human Services uh, as an umbrella and the agencies that exist within the Health and Human Services, which includes all the agencies I'm sure you are aware of the Centers for Disease Control, the FDA, the NIH, and many others. And in the report, it says that these agencies should develop a toolkit, and they mean by that standardized and validated tests appropriate for screening and diagnosing, not only in primary care, but they have been asked as part of the report and commissioned to develop tools that emergency doctors can use, that mental health can, providers can use, physical therapy, and all the medical subspecialties that encounter patients with ME-CFS, like rheumatologists or neurologists. So this, this report, if followed, puts some responsibility on the federal government to develop these tools, uh, to move forward, to spend money, to develop questionnaires and history tools that are valid across populations. And the report says 
that doing this is an urgent priority. That's pretty strong, and that's a strong message to the federal government who funded the report. It also says that the federal government should fund an unbiased revision, revision of SCID diagnostic criteria, and not in 10 years, but soon, within five years, so that we can continue to enfold emerging scientific evidence, such as evidence about uh, the neuroimmune or autoimmune nature of this illness that's starting to come into the literature and others. Uh, there are lots of things going on, and at any given point in time, there will be, well, every, at every point in time, literature is coming and being published. So this is a strong message that not only should the government uh, create these diagnostic tools, but they should provide the money to review the diagnostic criteria and continue to move them forward as the science progresses. That is going to help diagnosis. In the report, there is an entire section called Appendix C that discusses disability in ME-CFS SEID. That takes the, uh, the unknowns about disability and puts it in print in a very accessible form. And that, of course, is part of diagnosis. Clinicians need to be able to record in the medical record the illness manifestations in a way that communicates not only the diagnosis, but how this diagnosis impacts the patient. So um, not only is there a discussion of disability, but there is a reference to the Social Security uh, recommendations. And the most recent publication is, I've got it in the footnote at the bottom, SSR 14-1P, which is the sort of the Bible uh, to for disability determination, saying that this is a diagnosis that can be made. And the IOM report lifts from the Social Security ruling the exam findings and laboratory tests and other objective markers that can be used to document the diagnosis, including a number of signs on physical exam, certain labs that while not proof, may be supported, Those, uh, the spots and findings on MRI scans, documenting orthostatic intolerance in the record with physical exam, stress testing, cardiopulmonary testing, sleep studies, all of those things can be used to document objective, some of the objective findings and to strengthen the medical record in terms of diagnosis. So this is very, very positive because there aren't very many clinicians who will dig into the Social Security disability literature, um, and this puts it right in the report so they can uh, pursue it, and if they could just read the report and see what it is they have to do to build a substantial medical record for those people who are unable to work and might be eligible for Social Security disability or other kinds of disability support. What else about the report is going to improve diagnosis? Well, I was quite impressed um, with the effort and the plan made by the Institute of Medicine as part of the statement of task, remember, to create a plan for dissemination. And this is one whole section in the report. You can refer to it. This. Uh, this started with a bang on the first day, the day that the IOM was, uh, the, the report was announced on um, February 10th. I think I put those, uh, those, it was February 10th. I think I did that European style up there. But on February 10th, more than 500 articles were released in the media. And I listed just a few of them there, some of the high profile reports, uh, the Journal of American Medical Association, the Annals of Internal Medicine, New York Times, Washington Post. You know, you saw, we all saw the media. That was a wonderfully orchestrated uh, uh, release by the media, you know, at the media participation to raise awareness. And this awareness will eventually improve diagnosis. In fact, uh, we were sent a report uh, at some point saying that there were more than 720 online articles. And the impact of that, not just on the first day, but as it sorted out, was more than 
900 million unique visits to those online articles. That is, was just the initial uh, public um, response in terms of dissemination. But the IOM report has more than that. But I will say that um, there were articles or uh, editorial type articles online in JAMA and the Annals of Internal Medicine that were aimed at physicians at the level uh, of what a physician would expect. But in addition, internally in the uh, Institute of Medicine report, the dissemination strategy is in Chapter 8, and you can see it's 15 pages long, very uh, comprehensive, suggests this, that the Department of Health and Human Services agencies should all adopt and coordinate the use of the new diagnostic criteria. That's number one. Number two is that the, that the results of the report should be disseminated to health care providers, not just primary care for providers, but OBGYNs, emergency rooms, psychologists, psychiatrists, neurologists, rheumatologists, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down to physical therapists, chiropractors, osteopathic pr practitioners, and fitness instructors. So they, the recommendation is to widely disseminate these criteria so that proper diagnosis and treatment can be made based on these evidence-based uh, um, diagnostic criteria. Even beyond those major areas, the federal agencies and healthcare providers, it is recommended that these criteria should be disseminated to schools, professional societies, used in medical education events, um, uh, disseminated through uh, online ed med education outreach, incorporated into the training of medical providers, and included on their board exams, licensing, certification organizations, disseminated to large healthcare systems, medical groups, managed care, insurance providers, as well as what we saw in the media and social media. So if these recommendations are taking, taken seriously, you can see that the potential for diagnosis improves dramatically. Will, these, will the SEID diagnostic criteria improve diagnosis? Well, the major purpose of the report is to improve clinical diagnosis, and it will succeed if it's supported, if these recommendations are carried out as recommended in the report. Now remember that the diagnostic criteria are a separate issue from the name. We were asked to recommend whether a new name would be a good idea, and you know, it's, I'm not going to get into the argument of the name today, but except to say a couple of things. One is a new name can help overcome old stereotypes or just let doctors walk away from their previous attitudes and start over with a fresh, maybe more informed view. But this name describes the practical consequences of the illness. The fact that SCID impacts the entire body across many systems and has somewhat unique, the, the unique feature of post-exertional malaise and results in functional capacity can no longer be ignored when the disease is described every time the name is spoken or written. That was the intent of the committee. So I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk about how these diagnostic criteria will improve treatment. Now this goes beyond the Institute of Medicine report. We didn't talk about treatment in the report. So I'm going to share my opinions about how, this, how these diagnostic criteria might improve treatment. I mean, the first is you've got to have a diagnosis to get treated. So until people have a proper diagnosis, they're not going to have treatment. So that, of course, is number one. The second is that if the, the diagnostic criteria call attention to the major disabling symptoms. That gives physicians a target for treatment and validates that these major symptoms are real and debilitating throughout the report. Hopefully that will begin to improve treatment. More specifically, you know, many treatable aspects of this illness have been overlooked 
or treatments have been avoided by health care providers for a number of reasons, mostly because they just can't see, couldn't see the illness. They, did, they were focused on things in the criteria or stereotypes that weren't the major issues. But I think primary care physicians know more than they think. Um, I said there, PCPs don't know, they already know more than they think. We have tools that we can use until research advances aiming more at the primary etiology or directing treatment at the, the cause. So I'm listing the major uh, aspects of the criteria plus pain here. Post-exertional malaise, recognition of that allows treatment of it. Supporting pace, pacing or PEM reduction or prevention strategies is an important treatment. It might be one of the best, most effective treatments we have learning how to pace and preventing exacerbation of symptoms. That is an important move forward about treatment from the diagnostic criteria. It might be the most important uh, addition to the diagnostic criteria, the requirement of post-exertional malaise in some form, or the potential of post-exertional malaise. Of course, if people pace perfectly, sometimes the post-exertional malaise symptoms uh, are reduced because people learn not to induce those. But we need the healthcare providers on board with that strategy and to recognize this as a major diagnostic, uh, a major presentation and limiting feature of the illness. Now regarding sleep disturbances, we have many tools. We have specialists in sleep. We have lots of things to study sleep. So, and we have a, a big literature, not only of FDA approved sleep drugs, but of all the non-FDA approved medications we have that assist with sleep and treat problems during sleep. This might be the area of medicine that we have the most information, yet physicians have been the most hesitant to implement. So putting these, this severe aspect of the illness up in the diagnostic criteria will open the door for physicians to be able to, and other healthcare providers, to be able to support and treat and study and help uh, with sleep. The unrefreshing aspect of sleep is the hardest thing to fix, but there are many other disturbances of sleep that we can empower the patient to, uh, to address, not only uh, with medications, but education about how to manipulate sleep hygiene and not, uh, not worsen sleep. Orthostatic intolerance, um, boy, that was just off the radar of most healthcare providers regarding this illness. And healthcare providers don't routinely do orthostatic vital signs or ask. Even the patient themselves are not always aware that orthostatic intolerance is contributing to a lot of the symptoms. I would advise everybody to read that section on orthostatic intolerance and autonomic dysfunction because you might be surprised how many symptoms of this illness can be caused by orthostatic intolerance, including things like heat and cold intolerance and cold hands and feet and other things that we might attribute to other underlying causes. We have a literature. There are doctors who, there are things doctors can turn to to understand POTS, to, under, to treat and identify orthostatic hypotension, to evaluate fainting and all the other aspects of orthostatic intolerance. They just have to know to look for it. And once they document it, we have things. We know what to do. And we know what not to do in patients when they have orthostatic intolerance. So this will open up a whole new avenue of treatment for physicians, even if they're not familiar with this particular illness presentation. I think that cognitive impairment is very important because Healthcare providers need to recognize the cognitive impairment. I think they would be more patient. They would allow more time. They would change the way they approach or teach or gather a history if they had some insight about how cognitive fatigue impacts a patient who comes to the office. Until they recognize that aspect of the diagnosis, they're not going to be able to respond to it with the appropriate recognition and patience and treatment. And there are sometimes even medications that we can use that improve cognitive impairment, along with treating all the other symptoms improve cognitive impairment. You know, pacing, better sleep, treatment of orthostatic intolerance, all can improve cognitive impairment. So understanding how these major presentations of illness impact each other 
even if we don't know what causes them, will allow doctors to provide better care and make better choices when they're trying to uh, provide care, prescribe medications for patients. And of course, the last area of pain, with that growing fibromyalgia literature and approved drugs and many other drugs that aren't approved, um, we, we know how to address uh, the pain if it's present and, um, you know, the pain also responds to treatment of the other diagnostic criteria. So they're all linked again. So I think that as, you know, if this all hinges on dissemination, education, uh, ed the, the gradual acceptance of these criteria, which I think will be higher than they ever have been because they're evidence-based and came down through these academic channels, I think we will be able to change the face of medicine, actually, with how often the, the disorder is diagnosed and empowering uh, clinicians to begin to offer treatment. How else will the SEID diagnostic criteria improve treatment? Well, I think there's a good possibility that understanding the diagnosis, understanding the illness presentation will help clinicians put mental health assessment and support in the proper perspective. We know that it's devastating. There's a grief response. There's a lot of anxiety and dread around this illness. And, and uh, there, it's discouraging. And people do de develop depression. But understanding it in the context of a severe chronic illness is going to change the way it feels to have, the, have mood symptoms and mental health support identified by providers and treated in the right context and perspective. I think that the diagnostic criteria are going to change how patients are treated outside of medical profession, in the workplace, by employers, at school, hopefully the way health insurance uh, treats patients and the way medications are covered, and of course uh, how patients are treated by disability determination, not just Social Security, but long-term disability providers. These di diagnostic criteria are going to change how, how we're treated, how patients are handled. Um, it's also uh, very hopeful because the FDA has been very, very helpful uh, that I think we'll see a, a move forward with pharmaceutical companies and FDA and development of, of drug approval. That will take some time, but it is going to happen. And last but not least, um, having more patients who are diagnosed are going to create many more potential research participants. And I encourage patients, if you qualify, to participate in research because this will improve future diagnostic criteria as we revise them. It will improve identification of biomarkers and subgroups and then the development of treatments. And because we've had difficulty defining the illness, measuring outcomes, recruiting patients, uh, things have been slow and in terms of the interest in research and funding, especially regarding treatment. So I think this will improve. So will the SEID diagnostic criteria uh, improve diagnosis and treatment? Yes, I think it will. So now I'm going to turn the mic back to Suzanne. Am I unmuted? I can hear you now. Oh yay! <laughs> I was panicking. I've been I've been uh, very busy writing down questions and answering questions, and we've got a bunch of them, um, Cindy, and many. Well, they're they're just all great. So let's start with. Um, the, there's there were a lot of questions about how to really get doctors to embrace this new criteria, use this criteria, um, you know, have this report really help um, infuse SEID into the medical mainstream. How do you think that's going to happen? How long is it going to take? I don't know. I think we should come at it from all directions. So we should um, work through political channels so that because the federal government, of course, responds to what comes down from our politicians and our elected officials. They are dependent on uh, our, pol our elected officials for funding and direction and how they're going to proceed. Um, I do believe that internally the federal bodies that have been involved in this illness want to move forward 
And so if empowered, I think they will. Regarding physicians, I think it's going to take a little more time. It, it will come down through official channels slowly, but you know, I've, I've encouraged patients who've come into my office who are seeing a specialist, for example, to call up the criteria, go to those pages, and just print those pages. So orthostatic intolerance, we can go see a cardiologist, right? Print those pages in the orthostatic intolerance and uh, autonomic section. There's, you know, five, six, seven patient, uh, pages and take them in to your healthcare provider with the reference. So, and uh, so they can go on and look at the criteria, read the research, read the published studies, and then use those to make decisions. So I think each individual patient can be instrumental it's hard to tell doctors what to think, but you can put research in their hands and give them references if they're motivated. So I think if we all work together, we can accomplish it. Do you think that physician's guide is a good thing for patients to print out and, and, um, and hand to their physicians just in case they haven't yep, heard I think, it yet? Yep, the 20-page physician guide uh, is really quite good. It's not detailed enough, though, for a specialist. So um, I think the, I just, I just met with some neuroscience faculty at our university to talk to them about the changes and the new diagnostic criteria. And one of them, both of them had really nice uh, women and uh, they both had seen patients and kind of were on that defense and a little bit of eye rolling. And they said, wow, you know, that, yes, the physician, uh, the, what was it called? Yes, that, that, those uh, recommendations, the 20 pages are, were helpful but they needed as neuroscience specialists to dig into the sections they were interested in to really get what the report was going to offer them. Hmm. Okay. So back to you know, actions by um, the federal agencies on this report. We want to keep the momentum going that, that you showed, you know, 9 million, more than 900 million, I think it was, media hits or whatever. How can we what can we do to ensure that DHHS and the federal agencies don't drop the ball on this? Um, you know, I probably get in trouble for saying this, but unfortunately, things have, slid, have slowed down because of argument about the name itself and kind of uh, distracted people from the diagnostic criteria. So I think more focus on what the diagnostic criteria are is going to be helpful and everyone who's involved in making a decision about accepting the name or changing the name or doing whatever is going to be done needs to be get done, move on, and so that our federal bodies can focus on uh, the things they're supposed to do with the report, which, you know, the name is a very, very, very small portion of all those things I presented. So um, I think we just need to uh, use every avenue, you know, write to our write to them, engage in studies, uh, communicate, and see if we can move it forward. And nonprofit organizations, educational organizations, we should all, uh, you know, kind of move beyond the argument of what we're going to call it and really move toward the strength of this report, which should really move the field forward in terms of diagnosis and treatment. Good point. One of our listeners um, wrote in saying that her um, insurance um, agency is already using the, ne the, the name SEID. Um, so that, that's an important, an important piece right there. Do you know if there are any of the major medical um, societies, professional societies, um, kind of getting behind this new diagnostic criteria, like the AMA, the APA? Well, the fact that both the journal, you know, JAMA, which is the journal of the American Medical Association, the journal of the AMA that goes to all doctors, the fact that they would publish that on the day of release shows they have no qualms about supporting this. And I think the same is true with uh, the other medical journals that have Im included stories. And I find it to be refreshing after, being, after present, being present in the field for a couple of decades and being ignored, just like the patients, it's changing. It's changing about as quickly as things can change. So I think, again, um, it is the CFS community that's arguing about the name, not the people outside the community. They're just going to say, okay, whatever. 
I would tell everybody to practice saying systemic exertion and intolerance disease so that you can speak it. It is tongue twisting, it's because we it's new. But we say exertion intolerance all the time in the field. I say exertion intolerance every day. So just stick systemic on the front and disease on the back. And we just need to do it, not be hesitant. So there was um, a couple of questions about how to advocate for a name other than uh, systemic exertion intolerance disease, like ME. Um, and you would say that that's probably not very advisable at this point in time. Well, I, again, I can't speak for the Institute of Medicine Committee on this because actually we didn't make any statement about what to do with previous names and uh, other diagnostic criteria. Diagnostic criteria always exist for every disease. They're not really going to go away, but CUDA criteria will still be, be present. What we want is to stop using the word chronic fatigue syndrome. And I don't need to go into it, but there are a lot of reasons why the committee couldn't adopt ME, and it's really discussed in the report, and I don't, we don't need to debate that because it's done. Right. But as a as a person in the field, I'm not opposed to using the term ME, but I also think we should use SEID. So uh, I'll just throw that out there, right? ME is the word used everywhere outside the U.S. There's no reason we can't say ME, but these diagnostic criteria are SEID criteria, the ones that we talked, that we just went through. This yeah. particular set of criteria are new in this way, in this arrangement, looked at like this. So if we want to use these criteria, we probably need to call it SEID, and I don't think we ought to spend a lot of time renaming these criteria. Right. So there is a working group of the CIFSAC, the Chronic Fatigue Advisory Committee, to the Secretary of Health, and I think they'll be discussing it, the working group is discussing it, it'll be present in the meeting. I'd like to encourage all of us to come to some consensus and move forward so we can do the bigger work, which is teaching doctors about how to make a diagnosis and moving toward treatment. We can mainstream this illness in a few years. If I think we could mainstream this illness in a year if we all jumped on the bandwagon, but we could also waste five years trying to decide what to call it. Yeah, here, here. Um, about early diagnosis, do you think these criteria are sufficient to get patients diagnosed sooner? You know, from, from our surveys, in many cases, it takes, it takes patients many, many, many visits a year and many, many years before they even get a diagnosis. Do you think these criteria will help with early diagnosis? I do. Um, the, the diagnosis is delayed for a number of reasons, part of some of which I discussed, and I think if the report is widely adopted, A, people will get a better diagnostic workup right away. People can entertain this as a working diagnosis while they're excluding things and providing supportive care. And at that six-month mark, you, know, they can, you can still use it as a working diagnosis, but the reason the six-month mark is suggested is lots of people fall out and no longer meet the criteria in that six-month period. So we don't want to diagnose people with this inflating the numbers of who gets better, right? We want to focus on the people that have severe, prolonged, debilitating illness, and to do that takes a little bit of time. So, but I think that it will improve the rate of diagnosis probably down close to that six-month time. And yeah. it's, a, it's a busy and important six months of, you know, uh, watching for certain things to go away and seeing specialists and, you know, uh, that's a, I don't have a problem with, with those, uh, the, the numbers. I think it'll speed things up. Do you think the lack of immune type um, symptoms in the diagnostic criteria uh, will affect the ability to get a diagnosis early? Like no, be, fever, uh, chills, et cetera? I don't think so, if people are familiar with the report, because the report extensively describes how people present. Right. But if you look at the numbers, um, you know, we all have our view of the illness based on the people we've encountered or if we have it ourselves or we know five people who have it. But to look, if you look at the numbers, certain things aren't present at all stages of illness. And we wouldn't want to exclude those people from the diagnosis if their immune symptoms go away, for example. If you don't have fevers anymore, 
Well, a lot of people don't have low-grade fever. Some people don't even get sore throats. Some viruses don't cause sore throats. They just cause other symptoms. So we try to reduce the focus on symptoms that come and go or aren't present in everybody, but they're included as symptoms that can support the diagnosis. Yeah, such a remarkable group of people that got together um, to create this, again, landmark, remarkable, and, and highly important report. Um, there was a question about, do you think you guys have the respect that you, um, the committee members that is, have the respect that you need in order to really make the difference with this report? Um, I, I do think that the committee is respected by the body of medicine, by a particularly academic physicians and scientists. And they have been, honestly, perhaps the least supportive. So we're going to convert, so to speak, the biggest skeptics with this kind of a report. Ordinary primary care physicians might not even know what the IOM is. Um, certainly the feds do, and they commission the report, and all of the federal bodies will respect this report. Our politicians will respect the report. So other than people who don't know what the Institute of Medicine is, um, I think those who do know what it is and are engaged at that level are going to have a great deal of respect for the report. Um, so you, uh, a little bit earlier, you talked about um, some specialists and there were some questions about like the role for, of cardiologists, et cetera, and, and dealing with prominent symptoms like orthostatic intolerance. Um, is there maybe room for, for reaching out to the, to specialty societies and memberships and professions? I think so. Um, and I'm hoping that laying out the findings and the research is going to pro stimulate that in these specialty communities. I think specialists are intrigued. They, have, they know they've seen patients. They just don't have tools. Yeah. In fact, when I talk to them about this, they go, oh, I know, I've seen that, I've seen that. And it'll just, I think it'll be catalytic, actually. Um, it's not a new illness, right? The illness is all around us. We all see the patients. It just hasn't been crystallized uh, in the right way to be uh, accepted based on the way medicine functions. This is through the normal channels of the way uh, criteria are accepted, so I think they will be. Mm -hmm. A couple of disability questions, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll bring it to a close. Um, the, uh, the current disability criteria are not the same as the uh, diagnostic criteria proposed by the IOM. Um, how do you think uh, disability will be affected by this somewhat discrepant mm -hmm. issue? We went many, many, many years without the current, you know, without good Social Security uh, uh, support in, on, on paperwork. And it took a lot to move that forward. Unfortunately, we finally got some changes made that were suggested probably years ago, and just before the IOM convened. So I can't speak for what the uh, Social Security Administration will do. Things move slowly. But the IOM report says all the federal agencies need to adopt these criteria. Yeah. So it will come top down, and I, I think it will happen. I, don't, I can't say how long it will take. But it will enrich the current uh, Social Security rulings. So we have ex officios from all of the DHS agencies um, on the CFS Advisory Committee. Um, so it seems like the CFS Advisory Committee has a big role in making sure that the IOM criteria are really taken up and distributed and enforced, that's not the right, the right word. Disseminated. Um, disseminated and used, you know, that people pay attention to this. Do, do you think the, the CFSAC can do this? I think they can definitely um be important in the communication. And, and of course, the CFSAC is not just the people on the committee, but it's the people who give input to the committee, which is all of us. 
Yeah. So, you know, you have the opportunity to email, to uh, make presentations, to send things in by mail, and to uh, encourage this committee. We don't necessarily want a committee of people representing us without our input. So I'm sure they would value your input in having to make some of these weighty recommendations and decisions. So I encourage people to give input to the committee. Mm. Yep. Good. Very good. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Bateman, Cindy, my friend, for um, this hour of incredible information and inspiration and more hope for the MECFS community than I think we've had in a long time. I thank everyone who's stayed on with us for the past hour, and we look forward to um, your participating in our upcoming webinar series. Um, so stay tuned, and thank you.